Notice the square root. What's the funny thing about square roots? Anybody have a thought about square? What's the square root of four? What's the square root of four? Plus or minus two. Ah. You said plus or minus two. I just put plus two here. What's minus two? What do I do with the minus? Einstein's theory is predicting something really bizarre. It's predicting negative energy. There has to be both positive and negative energy. So if I have an electron, it can have, it can be sitting still, and it has energy equals m electron squared c squared. And if I move it, it's got kinetic energy as well. It ought to be possible to have an electron sitting still, according to this, with negative energy. And people began to sweat this fact. First of all, this is a disaster. It's a disaster because if you've got a hydrogen atom with an electron sitting there in the ground state orbiting the proton, the electron has positive energy, the proton has positive energy, that's not the ground state anymore because the electron could hop down to a Bohr orbit with minus mc squared plus kinetic energy, with negative kinetic energy as well, emitting a really energetic gamma ray a gamma ray with two mc squared of energy. Now you got a hydrogen atom uh, with a negative energy electron, and now it just starts gaining energy, because if gaining motion energy, because it gets more and more negative energy. If I increase p, the momentum, I still have an overall minus sign. The thing keeps losing energy as it accelerates, radiating radiation. It gets worse and worse. All things would be unstable, even the proton at the nucleus would jump down into a negative energy state and would start, everything would start moving and, 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 and getting more and more negative infinite energy. The world would collapse. Complete disaster. There's no stable theory, no stable world. Looks like we're at a dead end. The very beginning, I told you about the, the electron being a spinner. And I told you because spinners are square roots of vectors. Is a very peculiar behavior. But you have to rotate them not through 360 degrees, but you've got to rotate them through twice 360 degrees to bring them back to themselves. And it turns out that means if I put two electrons in the same state and I just swap their positions, it's the same as rotating this guy through 180, this guy through 180, and therefore that state equals minus itself. So that state is zero. It cannot exist. Electrons cannot be put in the same physical state at the same time. You can put two electrons in the same state of motion. Spinners are either up or down, spin up or spin down. If the first electron goes in up, the second goes in down. That's what happens in helium. And you can't put any more electrons in that state of motion. You've got an up electron, a down electron going around the nucleus. No electron will hop in there because the states are filled. So the exclusion principle is due to the weird spin of the electron. So, there was a really brilliant, one of the most brilliant physicists of the 20th century, Paul Dirac. The string theorist will tell you he was the most brilliant because he thinks the way string theorists think. And really remarkable guy, mathematician and physicist. And he had a brilliant idea. He said, well, suppose all these negative energy levels of any momentum, that go all, it's a big ocean, it goes all the way down to negative infinite momentum. Suppose they're filled. Who says what a vacuum is? I'm going to say a vacuum is a state in which all the negative energy states that Einstein says are there are already occupied. Each level here has one spin up electron and one spin down electron. My vacuum is a humongous helium atom. It's an argon or krypton or whatever inert atom. It's, the vacuum is chemically inert. All negative energies are filled. Now I'm home free. Because if I have a, if I have a, an electron up here, a positive energy, that tries to jump down into, the, into one of these states. The state's filled already. Can't do it. I've stabilized the world. Dirac went to bed that night thinking, great, we now know how it works. And he wrote down the relativistic theory of the spin one half electron. He now knew how to interpret it. But the next morning, he woke up with a hangover. And he realized something weird will happen. I can take an electron that's already in the ocean, like a fish, part of the vacuum, and I can pull it in the boat. 
If I kick the vacuum hard enough, just the vacuum, empty space, I go and kick the vacuum. He thought he'd hidden it completely from view. They realized if you kick it hard enough, under the right circumstances, you can conserve energy and momentum. You will kick an electron out of the vacuum from negative energy to positive energy. Because this has negative energy. The whole, now, when that happens, it leaves an empty slot in the vacuum. Got to now think double negatives here. An empty hole in the vacuum is the absence of negative energy. So the hole in the vacuum behaves as though it has positive energy. The hole is also the absence of a negative electric charge, as what electrons have. Therefore, it behaves like positive electric charge. Therefore, what Dirac is saying is if you, under the right circumstances, hit the vacuum, You'll make what looks to you like an electron with positive energy and negative charge in a hole, an absence of a negative energy, negative charge, a positively charged mirror image of the electron, a positively charged positive energy. So it costs a certain amount of energy to yank this guy out of the vacuum. And when you have, you'll see what looks like a pair of particles. One positive charged particle and one negative. And here it is. A few years later, the first observation of the electron and the positron. And I don't know which is which. One is the electron and one is the positron. They've got a magnetic field here which would normally curl an electron going this way like that. And if that were an electron, it would curl the opposite way here. But it's curling like that, which tells you it's positive. And so Dirac predicted, this is like the ninth symphony of physics in the 20th century. It has marvelous stuff from Haydn to Mozart to, to Bach to Haydn and Mozart. And finally, along comes the master to rack, puts it all together, and makes the greatest prediction of all, that there must exist anti look, look what led to it. Galileo, changing the definition, which who said this is the symmetry, time is absolute. Einstein, who said, no, this is the symmetry. The speed of light is absolute. Therefore, the transformation laws are modified. Therefore, the relationship between energy and momentum is modified. Know if there's theorem that tells me how to modify the law. So I've got a symmetry in space, time. I've also got a symmetry in energy and momentum. It gives me the new result that m equals mc squared for, for particles at rest, plus motion, which agreed with what, the, what Galileo and Newton could perceive but is now a mere correction to this enormous piece. And then the bizarre consequence that the square root had to be taken, which is minus signs. The even more bizarre notion of electrons as spin one half spinners that change sign when you rotate them through 360 degrees, meaning you can't put two of them in the same state at the same time, Pauli exclusion principle, which explained the whole periodic table of the elements. And now Dirac says our vacuum is full of these things. And now you will make a positive energy electron and a, and a negative electric charge and a positive energy hole with a positive electric charge. Look at what a climb that was. And we do it every day at Fermi Lab. So we make a top quark and an anti-top quark, a bottom quark and an anti-bottom quark. We yank them out of the vacuum. It's efficient. We go down deep and we yank stuff out of the vacuum. And what we're wondering now is what's much deeper down in this big ocean? Now? What other stuff is waiting to be pulled? Okay, they're all yours, Roger.